There were two more murders 15 miles away. When the police arrived, they found the telephones and electricity lines. We have a weird homicide. The scene described by one investigator is reminiscent of a weird... Cup of murder. Some crimes can get so entwined with our pop culture that we forget the tragedy that truly happened and who was affected by it. On August 17th, 1980, a young girl was killed while on a trip with her family. A young girl whose death, for some, was boiled down to the funny catchphrase, a dingo ate my baby. So if you like your coffee hot but your bones chilled, sit back and start your day with a morning cup of murder. Alice Lynn Murchison, known by all those who cared for her as Lindy, moved from New Zealand to Australia with her family in 1969. Raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, Lindy soon found her husband, New Zealand-born Adventist pastor Michael Chamberlain. The pair married on November 18, 1969, and after five years of living in Tasmania, the pair moved to Mount Isa in Queensland, where Michael would eventually serve as a local pastor. Shortly after their marriage, the Chamberlains welcomed two sons, Aidan and Reagan, into their family. And on June 11th, 1980, Lindy proudly welcomed her much-anticipated baby girl, who they named Azaria Chantel Lauren Chamberlain. Now, Lindy was, by all accounts, an exceptional mother, who loved her children with all she had. But that love didn't seem to be enough to save her daughter from a horrific tragedy, nor enough to convince the public that she wasn't the one responsible. On August 17th, 1980, the Chamberlain family was on a camping trip to Uluru, having arrived at the monolith the day before. The day was spent having fun as a family, with the boys climbing up the rocks while Lindy carefully cradled Azaria in her arms and explored Fertility Cave. It was just outside the cave that she noticed a dingo, a type of wild dog, staring at her from a distance. She would later say she got the feeling that the wild animal was casing the baby in her arms. Noting the creature, the Chamberlains went back to the camp, and as the day turned into night, Lindy carefully placed two-month-old Azaria in the tent for her bedtime, while she and her husband gathered around the barbecue with some other campers. The next thing anyone heard was the horrific cries of a terrified mother screaming, my God, my God, the dingoes got my baby. Police were, of course, called to try and find a way to save baby Azaria. And when the first investigator arrived, he pointed a light inside of the tent to find blood on one of the rugs and paw prints leading away from the tent's entrance, while six-year-old Aiden wailed in the background. The dingo has our bubby in its tummy. It should be noted that while the blood splatters were photographed and sampled, they were never tested and the amount seen has been disputed over the years. Just before Azaria was placed in the tent, the Chamberlains had been chatting casually with Greg and Sally Lowe, another couple who was vacationing with their infant. Sally would later testify that at around 8 p.m., she walked over to the trash bin and saw a dingo following her a few feet behind. Minutes later, Lindy chastised Michael for tossing food towards a dingo that appeared near their barbecue, saying you shouldn't encourage them as it pounced on a mouse that Aiden had just been chasing, basically proving that dingoes were in the area at the time of Azaria's disappearance. So realizing the magnitude of a wild animal carrying off a baby, nearly 300 men and women formed a human chain to try and track where the animal may have run off to. But one person was notably missing from the search efforts, Michael Chamberlain, who told fellow campers, she's probably dead now. I am a minister of the gospel. While the large search only turned up a few tracks, a tourist named Murray Haby followed a set that he found under a sand ridge and found a small depression in the sand that he believed came from a dingo laying down something heavy. He called over investigators who, along with a native tracker, examined the depression and found faint signs that the object had been wrapped in a knitted material. The men looked for more tracks that may have led away from the depression, but found nothing. A week later, and about two and a half miles away from where the tent was located, Azaria's jumpsuit was found with what looked like blood stains around the neck. With that, everyone grew certain that baby Azaria was no longer a missing person. Now, pretty early on, the entire continent began choosing sides in the case of Azaria Chamberlain. On one hand, the dingo threat seemed pretty well documented, with an Uluru chief ranger writing to the government two years before her disappearance, urging a dingo cull and warning of the imminent danger they possessed to human beings in the area. Others weren't so sure. So an inquiry into the event took place in Alice Springs, and according to a local magistrate and coroner Dennis Barrett's reports, his findings backed the story that Michael and Lindy had been telling. These findings, as well as the critiques of the police investigation, was broadcast live on television. But the Supreme Court quickly quashed the findings and ordered a second one to take place in December of 1981. This time, the coroner who performed the second inquest stated that, although the evidence was widely circumstantial, a jury could arrive to the conclusion that the Chamberlains, knowing dingoes in the area were an issue, simulated an attack to try and get away with murdering their daughter. Claiming they may have recovered Azaria's buried body, removed her clothing, damaged the jumpsuit to look like a dingo attack, rubbed it in the vegetation, and left it to be found a week after the initial search. Given this information, in September of 1982, Lindy Chamberlain was charged with Azaria's murder and Michael as an accessory after the fact. With that, the case of the dingo went national. The prosecution, when the very public trial started, regaled everyone with their theory. They surmised that in the five to 10 minute absence from the shared campfire, Lindy returned to the tent, changed into tracksuit pants, 
took Azaria to her car and used scissors to cut her daughter's throat. After waiting for her to take her final breath, Lindy then hid her body in a camera bag in the car, cleaned up the car, and returned to the tent to set up the scene and change out of her clothes, and then led Aiden, who she had to bank on not noticing his sister's absence, back to the campfire. Greg Lowe would later testify that he observed Lindy go to the tent with Azaria and Aiden, and then walk towards the car with one arm around Aiden and the other seemingly empty-handed. The prosecution furthered their arguments by saying the evidence implicating a dingo was purely coincidental, and the fact that no one noticed blood on her clothing hours after the disappearance was simply good luck. However, Sally Lowe had a different version of events from that evening. She and Michael gave evidence that they heard a baby crying when they were all at the barbecue area together, meaning Lindy could not have been committing the heinous crime with which she was being charged. That it was only after the cry was heard that Lindy left the group and went towards the tent. And another witness, a woman named Judith West, who was camping about 100 feet away, testified to hearing the low, guttural growls that she claimed sounded very similar to the sounds her husband's dog made when he was slaughtering a sheep. Lindy also claimed that, as she made her way to the tent after hearing Azaria cry, she noticed what looked like a dingo emerging from the tent, having difficulty, and then shaking its head vigorously. That's when she knew Azaria was in its mouth. Scientist Dr. Andrew Scott, upon seeing photos of the blood inside of the tent, said it was consistent with a spray pattern caused by a dingo carrying a bleeding baby. However, he did not believe the blood was human. And according to his testimony, canine hair was located inside as well as on Azaria's jumpsuit. And the Chamberlains did not own a dog. President of the Dingo Foundation, Les Harris, told the courts that in his opinion, and based on years of studying the animal, he believed the dingo could absolutely place a baby's head into its mouth. And in fact, produced photos of them carrying around a baby-sized doll. However, a forensic expert gave evidence that, based on plaster casts of a dingo jaw, it was impossible for them to unhinge it enough to place an entire head in their mouth. There was also intense argument over whether the jumpsuit was damaged by a dingo or if it was done by human intervention, with some evidence showing that the intervention happened between the time of discovery and the time that police photographed it, but the men who found it saying the suit looked as though it was placed on the ground naturally. There were also questions about a matinee jacket that, at this point, had still not been found, despite being worn on top of the jumpsuit. And there was concern that a onesie, reportedly worn underneath the jumpsuit, was found inside out at the time of discovery, something Lindy swore she was very particular about and would never do. Basically, the trial was filled with a tennis match of evidence, pointing to two very different theories. But probably the most damning piece of evidence heard during the trial was evidence of fetal hemoglobin stains in the front seat of the Chamberlain's family car, thus, in the eyes of many, proving the prosecution's theory that Lindy killed Azaria inside their car. On October 29th, 1982, both Lindy and Michael Chamberlain were found guilty of their charges, almost entirely on the blood evidence found in the car. Lindy, who was pregnant throughout the whole trial, was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole, and shortly after the conviction, was escorted to a hospital where she gave birth to her fourth child on November 17th, 1982, a daughter named Kalia. Michael received a suspended sentence of three years. The media, which had already gone berserk from the minute the case was first reported, warped public opinion with rumors and jokes about Azaria and her parents. Cartoons were created and catchphrases, jokes, and skits filled all forms of media, to the point where much of the real details of the case were lost in intended humor. One particularly adverse reaction came when everyone found out that the Chamberlains were Seventh-day Adventists, a religion that many in Australia didn't look too favorably on at the time. False allegations started to spread that Azaria's death was part of a cult killing, or that the family took her off to some remote desert location and abandoned her. And an anonymous tip came in from a man falsely claiming to be Azaria's doctor and telling officials that the name Azaria meant sacrifice in the wilderness, when it actually meant God helped, with other sources reporting how Lindy dressed her daughter in black and how that meant something deeply nefarious. To put it quite plainly, to the world, Lindy was a villain. The Chamberlains knew they were innocent and knew that the convictions they received were due in large part to the sensationalization of the media and its bias. So they fought for an appeal. Well, their lawyers did on their behalf. The appeal to the federal court was dismissed. And another, done in 1984 and to the high court, was rejected as well. Things were looking bleak for Lindy. But in 1986, a chance and very tragic event took place that would send this case into complete overdrive. Earlier that year, English tourist David Brett fell to his death while hiking at Uluru. And after eight days of searching, his remains were found lying where he had lost his footing, an area surrounded by several dingo dens. Now, while this initially seemed completely unrelated to the Azaria case, several of David's bones had been carried away by dingoes. So they had to do some searching. And while they looked for David, they found that matinee jacket that had been missing for almost six years. With that, a new inquest was opened and the chief minister of the Northern Territory ordered Lindy's immediate release. During that new inquest, it was determined that the pivotal hemoglobin test was unreliable at best. And when similar tests were done later, it found that the sound deadener spray used inside of cars yielded virtually identical results. 
On September 15, 1988, the Northern Territory Court of Criminal Appeals unanimously overturned all of the convictions against both Michael and Lindy. They were finally free and two years later, awarded $1.3 million in compensation. In the aftermath of their trial, conviction, and exoneration, the nature of the forensic evidence and the weight given to it was called into question, as was the expert testimony, the police work, the bias of an unfair trial, and the hand the media played in that bias on what is considered the biggest, most misunderstood case in Australian history. Unfortunately, Azaria's case remained in limbo for quite some time. On December 13th, 1995, a coroner's inquest, the third in the case, found that her cause of death was unknown. And a fourth inquest, announced in 2011, took place that finally ruled a dingo responsible for her death. But not everyone believes this to be true. To this day, citizens of Australia are very much so divided on their opinion of the Chamberlain case, with many steadfast that the court got it right the first time and that a dangerous woman walks freely to this day. Thank you for joining me in my morning cup of murder. Please join me again tomorrow to hear what terrible thing happened on August 18th. Don't forget to rate and subscribe and let me know how you like it. If you want to help support the podcast, there's always Patreon or just sharing it with your true crime obsessed friends. And remember, stay safe.